curious. Slick cape, pale skin, a natural taste for human blood and aversion to garlic. Vampires. We don't like them here. But what exactly is a vampire? From sophisticated and charismatic, through monstrous and terrifying to sparkly high school students, modern media is full of vampires. It seems that everybody knows how to deal with those blood-drinking creatures of the night, but how much of the popular knowledge is useful for a monster hunter? To answer that question, we need to separate wheat from the chaff. Or in this case, modern-day vampire from its real-life counterpart. Today we will dive into the roots of the modern vampire and trace how this monster transformed from scourge of the Balkan villages to the world-famous aristocratic snob, with a certain king for biting the neck. Let's start with the name. This is the name for alleged demons who draw the blood out of living bodies at night, transferring it to corpses from which it flows visibly from the mouth, nose and ears. Here one understands dead human bodies which walk up out of their graves, suck the blood out of the living and, in so doing, kill them. The modern word vampire first appeared in England in 1732, and just like the Count Dracula from Bram Stoker's famous novel, it traveled quite a distance. The word itself most likely arrived through France, Germany, and was taken from 18th century Serbian term vampir. This word has many parallel terms in other Slavic languages in the form of Czech and Slovak upir, Bulgarian vapir, Polish vampir, or Belarusian, Ukrainian and Russian upir just to name a few. There were of course many other names for the blood-sucking monsters in these regions, but we will get to them when the time is right. To trace the origins of modern vampires we need to go back to the 18th century. In the year 1718 the Treaty of Passerowitz brought an end to the war between Habsburg monarchy and Ottoman Empire. Turks yielded substantial amounts of lands including Benedict of Temeshwa, parts of Serbia, Bosnia and Wallachia, which became a buffer zone between the two countries. A few years later an epidemic broke out and Habsburg officials became witnesses of some very unsettling practices. Imperial provisor Frombold, an Austrian overseer, was sent to the town of Kisolova, where nine people died in the span of eight days after a very short period of illness. According to local people, it was a work of a blood-sucking monster that emerged from his grave, a vampire named Petar Blagojevich. It doesn't have the same ring to it as Orlok or Dracula, does it? Of course, Blagojevich wasn't the first documented blood drinker, but it was a first rather famous vampire hunt amongst the high society of Europe during the Enlightenment. Frombold was an eyewitness during the opening of Blagojevich's grave and stated that the body was quite fresh, apart from the nose, which was rather sunken. His old hair and beard, and even his nails, had been shed, and new ones had grown. In his mouth I saw, not without astonishment, some fresh blood, which, as all agreed, he had sucked from those he had murdered. After the body of Blagojevich was revealed, Frombold wrote, The mob was becoming increasingly irate rather than shocked. They and the servants hastily sharpened a spear with which to stab the dead body and put it to his heart. During the stabbing, not only did lots of fresh blood flow from the ears and mouth, but other strange signs also occurred, which I will spare you on account of my great respect. At last they burned the body in question. Take him away.
The story of the Imperial Proviso was quickly turned into Flysheed and given a much catchier title, a dreadful occurrence in the village of Kisilova in Upper Hungary a few days ago. For the first time, readers in Vienna, the capital of Habsburg monarchy, were introduced to the story about blood-sucking monsters. A few years later, in 1731, the vampires became an international phenomenon due to the story of a field surgeon named Johann Flückinger, who described with great detail the decapitation and burning of the bodies of vampires in the village of Medvieda. The 18th century vampire controversy, or, in short, hysteria, has begun in earnest. Government officials, surgeons and soldiers were sent to the frontier villages of Habsburg monarchy to witness and document the aftermath of the vampire attacks, and the audience couldn't get enough of those bloody tales. For the Europeans of the Enlightenment era, vampires were just some delightfully disturbing stories from uncivilized Balkans that proved the superstitious and animalistic nature of people living on the frontiers of civilized Europe and under the Ottoman rule. Vampires in the 18th century poems and stories were a vivid reflection of prejudice and superiority that West held over the East. In the 19th century, stories about digging up the bodies, cutting off the heads and impaling the undead monsters were used to feed a new type of creature. Gothic writers. Yeesh! Those pale nocturnal loners who spent days roving in their abodes started to write about pale nocturnal loners who spent days roving in their abodes. Bram Stoker, Sheridan Le Fanu, John William Polidori and other authors of 19th century transformed the vampire from a monster preying in the villages to the sophisticated, charismatic creature with tremendous power. At this point, vampires became collections of clichés and stories that were created to entertain the audience in Western Europe. Because of that, modern vampires have barely any connection to the original folklore. Authors sometimes throw some vaguely Eastern European words into the mix, but the similarities to the Balkan blood-sucking creatures are only skin deep. Transylvania, the home of Stoker's Count Dracula, is as nebulous and unreal as a completely fictional place. Even the term Nosferatu, used by Stoker to describe his famous vampire, is, well, a mistake. Stoker took the word from Emily Gerard, who between 1883 and 1885 lived in the Saxon-inhabited towns Hermannstadt and Kronstadt in Transylvania. According to Thomas M. Bonn, in essence, Stoker borrowed the artificial term Nosferatu from Gerard as a designation for the Romanian variant of the vampire, as well as information she had provided on the defensive measures undertaken by the local population to ward off vampires. Here, however, Gerard was mistaken. Her choice of term possibly derives from a misunderstanding of the word necuratul, which is still in colloquial use today which literally means the impure, and that is commonly used to refer to the devil. In fact, the purpose of Gerard's book was not by any means to provide ethnological insights into a multicultural region, but rather to cater to the tastes of a broad readership who wanted to learn about the hillbillies of Transylvania. Despite popular belief, Bram Stoker did not model Count Dracula after the infamous Wallachian voivod Vlad Tepes, known better under his charming nickname The Impaler. According to Irving Stoker, Bram's son, the idea of Dracula came in a nightmarish dream after eating too much dressed crab. Quite disappointing cold and magnetic personality of the vampire was most likely an amalgamation of romantic tropes from contemporary literature and character of Sir Henry Irving, for whom Stoker was working in the Lyceum Theatre in London. According to Lewis S. Warren, Irving was a self-absorbed and profoundly manipulative man. 
He enjoyed cultivating rivalries between his followers and to remain in his circle required constant, careful courting of his notoriously fickle affections. There is virtual anonymity on the point that the figure of Dracula, which Stoker began to write notes for in 1890, was inspired by Henry Irving himself. Stoker's numerous descriptions of Irving correspond so closely to his rendering of the fictional Count that contemporaries commented on the resemblance. But Bram Stoker also internalized the fear and animosity his employer inspired in him, making them the foundations of his gothic fiction. So, the story of the infamous Count Dracula was born from two elements, a food poisoning and a fanfic about an imposing employer. Even the name of the vampire in question was not directly taken from Vlad the Impaler, who was indeed called Dracula, which means son of the Dracul. This sobriquet derived from his father, Vlad II, who was a member of the Order of the Dragon, a chivalric order formed in the 15th century to defend the Balkans against the threat of the Ottoman Turks. Dragons in Middle Ages were associated with Satan, cruelty and the forces of evil, which, by extension, also symbolized the threat posed by the Muslim invasion. Because of that, the Order of the Dragon took Saint George as their patron saint, a famous dragon slayer and the protector of Christian knights. Vlad II took the nickname Dracul, which also means dragon, because of his affiliation with the Order. Stoker, however, chose the word Dracula because it was used as a synonym for the devil. Basically, he called his vampire Count Evil. Probably names like Baron Demon and Prince Malice were already taken. In the end, we can quote the man himself. Dracula in Valachian language means devil. Moreover, Vlad the Impaler was a Valachian voivod, not a Transylvanian one. Why the change? The answer is quite simple. For the English audience, Transylvania was just an exotic locale, somewhere in the wild and half-barbaric Balkans. Julius Verne and other writers often used Transylvania as an eerie background for the stories, without any real connection to the history of the region. The theory about a direct connection between Count Dracula and Vlad the Impaler was created in 1958 by Basil Kirtley, and to this day is repeated without mentioning the fact that in the earlier draft of the novel the vampire wasn't called Dracula, but Count Vampyr, and he was an Austrian from Styria. Although Stoker went to the trouble of gathering information about Balkan folklore, which can't be said about most of the 19th century writers of the vampire-related books, he wasn't concerned too much with the accuracy. He freely modified and mixed different parts of the folklore to create a chilling story that would catch the attention of his readers. And thus, Stoker introduced to the audience some methods that aren't very useful when dealing with the vampires from Balkans and Eastern Europe. For example, Stoker's Dracula couldn't cross running water, enter the home without an invitation, and transform into mist. Those elements are present in the folklore, but not in regards to the vampires, which have absolutely no problem with entering houses without the proper permission. Stoker also introduced the concept of vampires' lack of reflection in the mirror and losing powers in the sun. The latter is somewhat connected with the notion that vampires are nocturnal predators, which wasn't always the case. However, in the year 1922, the German movie Nosferatu, a symphony of horror, an unauthorized adaptation of Stoker's Dracula, amplified the vampire's weakness to sun. In the movie, Count Orlok is destroyed when exposed to the sunlight, which became the staple of many movies, books, and TV series. Okay. What's that smell? However, if you think that you'd be safe by simply saying no to the vampire at the door and waiting for the dawn, you might be sorely mistaken. The vampires in fiction are bound by forces much more powerful than a silver cross or holy water. 
the plot. At the end of the story, our heroes must overcome the monster in some spectacular fashion, hence the need for the weakness that can be cleverly exploited. Thank you for listening, and I hope to see you next time, when we will talk about dealing with the real vampir, Nakzeira, Lugat or Vrykolakas. Keep your shovels sharp, and don't hesitate to sacrifice your henchmen. If you want to learn more about hunting monsters, check out our other videos, and if you want to support our noble cause, take a look at the video's description. Take care.